anyway, we look forward to being in God's Word together. Um, I'm sure we will go over a bit over time, but it'll be good. God's Word is always good. So I want to take just a break from Ephesians this week as we uh, kind of look to today um, and what the Lord has done and what we expect Him to continue to do in and through Manhattan Bible Church. So I want to look at a passage of Scripture that I think is important for us to continue to go back to, remind ourselves of, and, and always live there. Um, as we grow and mature as a body. See, I believe we must be sure that we don't forget what it is that we are to be doing and who it is that we are to be doing it for. We must not forget the blessed gifts we have so that we might continue to do the work of God. Manhattan Bible Church has a mandate. We have a mandate from the Lord. And he has entrusted us with precious truths and resources that we are to be using for his glory. Christ and the truth of the gospel are the most glorious gifts that the church has been given. And these are the most glorious truths that we have been given. Not only are they gifts, but they have been given to us to equip us for the work of ministry, and they've been given to us to share with others as well. So this morning I want to take a look at what what our responsibility should be as a church in regards to these things, in regards to these truths. See, unfortunately, far too many churches and Christians are content with burying these gifts in the dirt and not anticipating the return of a king. And I think this happens in many different ways. I see where the world and its lures have caused the church to lose focus on her real purpose. We get caught up in serving the good of society and not the best of our master. One author put it like this, There is something worse than death and something better than human flourishing. If we hope only for renewed cities and restored bodies in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. And we certainly aren't to ignore the issues of our culture and the world, but we need to understand that the church is not responsible for most of the problems in the world, and we are not then responsible to fix them. There is certainly a care and concern for the hurting and the vulnerable, but it's secondary to the real work we have been given, which is simply to know Christ and to make Him known. I think another way in which the church is neglecting its responsibility today is that the individual professing believer is abdicating his or her responsibility. Too many believing Christians, too many professing believers are content riding out their time on this earth thinking that their ticket is punched and they've got a free road into heaven. They're okay going to church and working and living a moral life, but anything outside of that is just, that's for the super spiritual. They don't engage with anyone around them, whether believer or unbeliever, in spiritual matters whatsoever. And they're glad to talk about the economy. They're glad to talk about sports or the weather. But spiritual things, we're getting a little bit too personal. That's just my own business. And this is a willful rejection, I believe, of what we see given to us, commands given to us by Christ our Master. I think a third way in which the church and the professing believer buries their talents or their gifts is ignorance. See, maybe the reason why many or some professing believers don't know what he or she should be doing here on earth is because the church doesn't know either. Churches have become little Hollywoods or Disneylands, entertainment centers for self-help focus groups where Christ, His Word, and His Gospel are considered uh, uh, optional and not authoritative. They've become one of the resources in life, not the only resource in life. So Manhattan Bible Church, as we grow and mature, we, we can't move away from the Lord and the gospel. We must not forget the very foundation, the very core, the very source of salvation in life. And it's what matures the believer and saves the lost. So again, what I'd like to do today is just remind us all of what we have here. 
what we should be doing, what Manhattan Bible Church should, what, what our focus should be, and what it is that we, where do we find our source and what motivates and informs our ministries and our lives. And we have to be careful that as a church that we don't add more ministries just for the sake of ministries. We have to make sure that the ministries that we do have are being done in the right way with the right motives and with the right focus. Doing doesn't mean a thing if the Lord or it doesn't mean a thing to the Lord if it isn't done for His glory and in His way. We always have to go back to Matthew 7. We find this group of men and women standing before the Lord. But Lord, we did children's ministry. We were busy in women's ministry. We had men's ministry and, and we did outreach. I served in the nursery and my kids picked up chairs after church. I discipled others. And the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. Busyness doesn't mean anything if you're not doing it for the Lord. We have to guard against doing. We have to guard against serving just to be serving. So this morning I want to turn with you to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 2 through verse 10, as we just kind of briefly overview this section. So please stand with me as we read this together this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 2, and we'll read through verse 10. Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you may become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning you, concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Oh, Father, once again, we come to You acknowledging our need for you to open our eyes and ears to see and hear the truths of your word, that we may, the, the cloud of our flesh may be peeled back so that we might see and behold your glory this morning. And two, Lord, convict us where we need conviction. Encourage us. Draw us to you so that we may be worshipers of you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So I want to just pull back a bit this morning and, and take a, a little bit of a bigger picture by looking at four aspects of the church that I believe it's essential for us to remember and to keep foundational as we move forward in the years ahead. We're going to, in these verses, we're going to look at today our, our mandate, our model, our motive, and our mission. So again, what is it that we should be doing, and how should we be doing it? What, what is the overall purpose of our church? What is it that Manhattan Bible Church should never move away from in any of our relationships, in any of our ministries, in worship? And how can we protect from just doing stuff instead of doing real, true, Christ-honoring ministry? So again, let's begin by looking at the church's mandate. As you look in Scripture, there's, there's five different passages that lay out for us the Lord's commission for His followers, for His church. And what we're going to see essentially is the same command is given in each one of these uh, different verses or passages. They're just from a different perspective. 
We're given the mandate from the Lord, but it's recorded for us in all four gospel by all four gospel writers. Again, similar command, just from their own personal perspectives. So we find these in the, in the Gospels and then also one in the book of Acts. The first and most likely the most familiar of these commissions is found in Matthew. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. So Matthew is writing his account to a, to a Jewish audience. Jesus in Matthew is presented as the rejected Savior King, who is in fact King, Matthew is, is claiming. Matthew's account or perspective, first of all, begins with the fact that we do have a King and His name is Jesus. So when we get to Jesus' post-resurrection, pre-ascension instructions for his followers, it's no surprise to us that Matthew tells us of Jesus' command to make disciples. He says to make followers of Jesus, to make servants of the King, not just converts, but followers, disciples, growing them in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. And he says we are to do this as we go and baptize and teach as we evangelize and disciple, as we engage those around us, our mindset is to enlist more servants of the king and teach them more about the king and what it looks like to follow the king. The second of these commissions is found in Mark. Mark wrote his gospel account with a, a different audience in mind. Instead of writing to the Jews, Mark is writing to the men and women in Rome, some of which would have been Jewish, but a majority of them, a vast majority of them, would have been Gentiles and Romans. And we see in Mark chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus declares that the gospel must be proclaimed in the whole world. He says, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And then in chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus assures his followers that not only must it be proclaimed, but it will be proclaimed. He says, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Mark is telling us these words in the context of communi communicating the power of the gospel, not just in Israel, but the whole world. He says the purpose of his account in chapter 10, verse 45. Paul writes, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So here, Mark speaks of the promise and command to proclaim the gospel, because there are those who need to hear it, and everyone must hear it, in order to know Christ, as Mark does. So the commission from Jesus that Mark record, records for us, is to proclaim Jesus in the power of the gospel. Luke then tells us the third and fourth commissions given to us and to the church. And again, Luke's account is even to a little bit different audience than Matthew and Mark. He's addressing the Greeks. And the first mandate we have from Luke's record is found in Luke 24, 46 to 48. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should, su should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses in these things. And then we see in, in Acts 1.8, Luke reiterates this again. He says, but as, G, as he records Jesus' words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, Luke's purpose in writing his accounts is to give an orderly account in order that Jesus might be presented as the ideal Son of Man. 
And as Jesus commissions his disciples to bear witness to his suffering and death, and that repentance and forgiveness should be proclaimed to the whole world, beginning in Jerusalem. And that's what Luke is, is telling us Jesus' words say. And here Luke's emphasis is on the disciples being witnesses to the person and work of Christ in his resurrection. Something that was rejected and considered unbelievable by the Greeks. And this is what we see happening in the book of Acts. The church cared for one another. They were unified and were co meeting daily. They were committed to the teaching of God's word and to one another. Their love for Christ and their love for each other compelled others outside the church to at least take notice of what was happening inside the church. These witnesses declared the truths of who Jesus was and what he had accomplished. Finally, we come to John's commission. John is writing his gospel account to anyone and everyone who will listen. John comes quite a bit later than the first three, and so he uses those as kind of his launching point. That's why John is different. Is he, he assumes that everybody's already read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so he, he kind of skips over their information. He, he kind of uh, adds and goes a different direction. But John's commission is found in verse 21 of, um, let me find it, I don't have it. It's in the, it's in the book of John somewhere. <laughs> but he says, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And in order to understand what Jesus means by sending us, I believe we need to understand what his being sent by the Father means. There are certain things that in God's providence he began to do and teach that he has now entrusted us to carry on and carry out. In Acts 1.1, Luke writes, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he'd given commands through his Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So there is an expectation of Christ that his disciples, that his church, will continue and seek to accomplish some of the things that he had started. And we've been entrusted with these things to fulfill this purpose and we'll continue to teach what he taught. We will continue to preach faith and repentance for salvation. We will continue to proclaim Christ as God and that only in believing in him can a person have eternal life. But I think there's more going on here. I believe that when Jesus says that he is sending us, just as he was sent by the Father, he's speaking of not just the task, but the relationship as well. See, Jesus came in full submission to the Father. He came to do the Father's will. As, as truly man, he, he relied completely and fully on the Holy Spirit. He came to the Father's glory. He came for the Father's glory and not his own. And he came to reveal the Father to the world. He came to be a servant and not a king. But there's another relationship that I believe needs to be addressed here as well. In John 17, 18, in, in, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, he prays this to the Father, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world as well. So Jesus in this context is speaking about his and his disciples' relationship with the world. He's not of the world. They are not of the world. He is hated by the world. They will be hated by the world. He's kept safe by the Father. They will be kept safe by the Father. Even in the world, they will be sanctified by the world, by the Word. And it's in these ways that we are to go. It is in these ways that we are sent in submission, in humility, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God, relying on the Spirit's work and power in the Word, and in opposition to the world, as enemies of Satan, as men and women in the world, but not of the world, hated by the world. So John's commission focus is not necessarily on the work, 
but the heart behind it. We are sent. We are to go with the same message and the same attitude and heart that our Savior came with. In his humility, he considered himself to be serving something much greater. And we are to consider that as well. So Matthew, make disciples. Mark, proclaim the gospel. Luke, be my witnesses. And John, continue to live in a world that will oppose you all the while teaching and proclaiming what Jesus did. Same story, different perspectives. In all of this, we are to be doing, yes, as individuals, but in community, as a body, as members of Christ's church, with Him as our head, edifying the saints and evangelizing the lost. It is these things that are to be being done inside and outside the church. And this focus is what edifies us as believers and causes us to evangelize outside. It unifies us. Because as we minister in this way, we are encouraged, we are taught, we are rebuked. And as we do this to one another and together, we are brought together in common mission and common purpose. We grow in our love for the Lord and for one another. So as we put all this together, the church has been given marching orders. Orders from the king and ultimately it comes down to one thing, making much of him. Making much of him amongst ourselves and making much of him out in the world. Pointing each other to who we are, in, or who are in the church and to Christ and those who are outside the church. These orders are not just reaching the lost, but encouraging and edifying the found. Who he is and what he has done has to be the starting point and the ending point and everything in between. And so now we turn, get to our passage in 1 Thessalonians. And this church can serve as a wonderful model for us as we see these things being carried out and lived out in this little church. So we're going to see now the, the church's model. And again, we're, hopefully you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And as you hear from Paul, from the outset of verse 2, he, he's overjoyed by the faith and its results in the lives of these dear young Christians. He gives thanks always and constantly prays for them. Paul's heart is very soft and tender, tender and gentle towards these people. And in verse 3, Paul speaks of their work that is a result of their faith. Now, what works Paul's referring to here in 1 Thessalonians is debated. Some believe that it's a general word for all good things that they do as a result of their conversions. Others think that Paul is referring specifically to verses 7 and 8. I don't think it matters, it certainly doesn't matter for us today. In either case, Paul's not referring to a single work or event or even the initial saving faith. Paul's referring to the ongoing work of the believer in, in the believer's life that is constantly motivated and energized by his or her growing and persevering faith. It's the work of ministry that we learned about in Ephesians 4. The work of the saints towards the saints that build up the saints and matures the saints and unifies us in love so the church might walk according to her calling. It's a work that produces a love for Christ and a love for each other. He also speaks of their labor that is born out of their love for one another. This is agape love. This is the highest and most selfless and sacrificial love that the Bible can explain. It's the Christian love which desires that which is always best for the other. And it produces not just works, but labor. Again, we don't know what this labor necessarily looked like. But we do know that there was a lot of affli affliction for these believers. And it could be referring to the constant need and help to care for others. It could be referring to the constant devotion to the spread of the gospel motivated by Christ. But again, in either case, it was ultimately Godward and others focused. And it was not easy. It was labor. It cost them their time. It cost them their preferences. 
It costs them their comfort. It costs them their safety. It costs them their status. It costs them their lives as they live for the best of Christ and for one another. And to round off this trilogy of true Christian virtues, Paul points out their hope that makes them steadfast. This is not referring to an endurance that just gets people by. Uh, this is an endurance or steadfastness that uses the trial and hardship, or as Paul mentions here in this passage, affliction, as an opportunity to make Christ known and make much of Him. This steadfastness doesn't ask, how can I get through this? It asks, how can I use this for the glory of God? What is it that Christ is asking from me in the midst of this affliction? How can I best serve the king when it feels like the walls are crumbling in on me? Notice again that there's one more thing that Paul wants to point out to these dear believers. He is thanking God for them. He points out their work and labor and steadfastness that comes from their faith, love, and hope. But in Paul-like fashion, he wants to make sure that it is God who gets the glory. And in order to make sure that in their immaturity, these believers don't begin to get too big a heads and take credit for these things themselves, he reminds them of where all of this started. He reminds them that they are loved by God. And this is the pivotal point in this whole passage. All that is mentioned prior, their works from faith, their labor from love, their steadfastness, and, and everything that, that comes after it flows from this love. Their election, the reception of the word, their imitation of Paul and Silas, and their example to others, all of it flows out of God's decision to set his love on them in eternity past. And this is not a love for which God has for the world. Notice, this is his love for those he has chosen. This is his special electing love that he, before the foundation of the world, determined to put on each and every person whom he would save. So whatever good came out of this body of believers, whatever good each individual believer in this church accomplished, it is ultimately found in God's love for them. Their salvation, their affliction, they were ready to use all of it to point each other and those outside the church to Christ. And how these men and women lived and what they proclaimed became, as we've seen, became known throughout all Macedonia and Achaia. In every direction, this faith and love and hope was made known. And when Paul says that the word of the Lord sounded forth from them, the, the picture here is a sounding board. It's a trumpet that amplifies the sound. The joy that these men and women had in the midst of affliction because of their salvation and relationships with each other magnified the sound of the gospel and it made it ring throughout all the, all the local area. And what this is indicating is that this result was not a planned, aggressive missionary program. Although those are important. It was not limited to formal outreach events but make no mistake, it was very intentional. It happened as the individual believers lived with the glory of the gospel in mind and related to one another with it in, their, in mind and took that to their workplace. They took it to their homes, to the grocery stores. It happened in the average mundane flow of life as they came into contact with others. They did not ever move away from Christ and the gospel. And then these others who heard it and saw Christ in the lives of the Thessalonians then took it with them where they were going and on their way. And it spread. And you can see the commissions being lived out by these believers. As these people lived their lives for all to see and shared the gospel with men and women around them, people were saved and disciples were made. Christ was proclaimed, men and women repented, sins were forgiven, and the hope of Christ's return was planted deep in their hearts. And the believers in Thessalonica were witness to the power of the gospel. 
because they had experienced it in their lives. They are witnesses to the joy that is found only in a saving relationship with Christ and a joy far outside of their present circumstances. And they did all of this in submission and reliance upon Christ, living in a world that did not love them, living in a world that hated them and opposed them, living in a world that was not their home with a community of other believers who encouraged and used their gifts to edify each other and point each other to Christ. This is our model for Manhattan Bible Church. The next truth that I want to point out to you this morning, I believe will help us moving forward, is the motive of the, Thessalo Thess the church in Thessalonica. As we've mentioned, it, it's a result of God's love that their faith, love, and hope are produced. It, it informs their work, it informs their labor and their steadfastness. We also see that this, it's an electing love, which Paul says he is assured of because they ultimately receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit that we see there in verse 4. He's telling these believers that the reason why they receive the word is because God loved them. And it is the reason why they are examples to others and why the word has sounded forth. God's love has caused this to happen to them and in them. But it's not just the cause, it's also the motivation for all of this. It's what motivated their work and their love and their steadfastness. If you have a chance at some point this week, turn to 2 Corinthians 4.14. Paul says this, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. This word that Paul uses here, this word controls, has the idea of constraint. It communicates being taken or directed. It's, it's to be put on a one-way street that is so narrow and tight that you cannot turn around and go the other way. Paul's saying that his life is controlled and motivated by God's love. John paints a similar picture for us in 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And like Jesus, our lives should be selfless in a constant dying to self. But like John and Paul, the, the believers in Thessalonica were motivated by God's electing love for them, an unearned love. An undeserved love, a, a sacrificial love, one that desires what is best for others. It's a, it's a death to self love. And it's the love that's communicated in the gospel by Paul. Brothers and sisters, you, were once, you once hated God and deserved His wrath. But in his selfless electing love, he became your righteousness and your sin so that you might live and receive the words of life. And now there is no condemnation. And it's the same love that God has for you that he has for these believers in Thessalonica. And this is why they were filled with love in the midst of trials. This is why they were an encouragement to one another, to Paul and to many others, and even us today as we read these inspired words. And this is why they sounded forth the word of the Lord. This is what motivated body life in Thessalonica. They were loved by the king. No longer his enemies. They were loved by him. You try to convince me of any other greater motivation to obey and serve our King than His love for us. I don't think you'll be able to. But in addition to all this, notice what else motivated them in verse 10. Paul says, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. They were waiting. This is not a waiting like a husband waits for his wife in the car as you're late for church. It's a groom waiting for his loving, beautiful bride as the doors in the church open in the back and she walks down the aisle. 
It's not a waiting like that of a patient in a doctor's office who's worried about some test results. It's a waiting for, it's the little kid on Christmas morning waiting and anticipating the gifts he or she's about to open. And in Macedonia and Achaia and everywhere, Paul was told that these believers in Thessalonica were joyfully and steadfastly waiting on Jesus to come again. This waiting, this, this hope, this assured expectation of Christ's return motivated their lives. It motivated their relationships. It motivated every word that they said. Does the promise of Christ's return cause you to wait like this? Well, how do we wait like this? Well, I think Paul helps us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this is what was happening in Thessalonica. By faith, these Thessalonians were beholding Christ. They were motivated by the glory of Christ. Paul said that the love of Christ controlled him, but it was also the glory of Christ that controlled him. We also read it on the night before his arrest in John 17, verse 24. Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me. For those whom God loves and gives His Son to, this electing love that Paul speaks of in 1 Thessal Thessalonians, and what Jesus prays for them is that one day the glory that we behold by faith today will one day be sight. That we will see Him as He is, John tells us. And as we grow in beholding Him by faith now in this present time and in this world and in our flesh, we will grow in our desire to behold Him in His glory when faith is no longer needed because we will be able to see Him as He truly is. John Owen says it this way. So it is only as we behold the glory of Christ by faith here in this world that our hearts will be drawn more and more to Christ and to the full enjoyment of the sight of His glory hereafter. If Christ is not beautiful to you today, what makes you think He'll be beautiful to you in heaven? If you are not in some way beholding His glory now, what makes you think that glory will mean anything to you in eternity? And this is what these young believers were waiting on. They desired their faith to become sight so as they could see the complete glory of their Lord and Savior. See, for them, just one day, one day in the presence of Jesus, beholding His glory was worth more than anything this world had to offer. Just one simple day in their glorious Savior's presence was worth everything that they had lost by receiving the word of truth. Just one day for them, just one day spent with the one who delivered them from the wrath to come is worth any amount of affliction that this world brought upon them. But it isn't just one day, it's an eternity. And the worth of His glory far outweighed all that the world could offer or dump on them. Suffering, affliction, trials, none of it was worthy to be compared to what they were waiting for. They were waiting for their bridegroom to come back for them. And brothers and sisters, this is how we are to be waiting. By beholding His glory now by faith and helping each other do the same. This is contagious. This spreads to other saints and it spreads to those outside the church as well as we've seen. Jesus was worth all of their lives and in the waiting they wanted to make much of Him in their lives with each other and to make Him known to others outside the church. We need to have a high view of God. 
We have to. And we need to behold His glory now by faith because He is worthy. And His worth and glory should motivate us to sound forth the word of the Lord so that we might know Him more and so that we might make much of Him to those who don't know Him. The final truth that we're going to pull out of this passage this morning is we need to be consumed with our mission. And speaking of the Thessalon Thessalonians, Paul tells us in verse 9 that they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Their salvation caused them to change their allegiance. Their master changed. They were no longer slaves to their sin in this world, but began to serve the one true God. And what we read about in these, in these verses was their new way of life. To God from idols. No riding the fence. No lukewarmness. They went away from the flow of society. They were delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. Now, although the word Paul uses here that we translate serve, it goes beyond worship to submission to, to God's lordship in every aspect of life, but it certainly does include worship. And these new believers knew and understood that the worship of God excluded the worship of idols. Jesus couldn't just become another God on the mantle. He had to be the only one. John MacArthur has written a very helpful book on worship. And really this is book, it's just taken from a sermon series in John 4. And his interaction between, or Jesus' interaction between he and the Samaritan woman. And at one point in the conversation, Jesus and this woman are speaking about true worship. And Jesus says, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. See, Jesus was sent to seek and save the lost, and so it's safe for us to agree with MacArthur when he says, one of the principal things God is doing in redemption is transforming sinners into worshipers. And he continues, the Father sent Christ to seek and save for the specific purpose of producing worshiping people. See, worship is nothing more than responding to the truth of who God is and what He's done and praising Him and pointing others to those truths. It's simply drawing attention to the glory of God and not allowing anything else to steal that glory from Him. And that is how Paul viewed his ministry. Paul says in Romans 1.9 that in preaching the gospel, he was worshiping God. So worship comes in a lot of different forms, not just the medium of music. And it shouldn't be just limited to Sunday mornings. Worship is a way of life, not just an activity. It's a way of life that is lived in light of God's glory, and we praise Him and magnify Him through obedience, through prayer, thankfulness, song, word, service, love for others, using our gifts to benefit the body and proclaiming Him to others. And if God is worthy of our worship, then we would also have to admit that He's worthy of others' worship as well. It only makes sense that as worshipers of a worthy God, we would want Him to be worshipped by others. So ultimately, the goal, the mission of our ministries and lives is worship. We worship as we teach and preach. We worship as we pursue obedience in our lives. We worship as we encourage, admonish, love, pursue unity. And we worship as we sound forth the word of the Lord. And we worship when others put down all hope of earning salvation on their own and fall at the feet of Jesus begging Him for mercy and they become worshipers as well. So as we wrap things up this morning, as you look through these verses, please notice how many formal ministries Paul mentions in these verses. Take a look at how he instructs the outreach committee or the women's leadership group. 
Look at how he says, or look what he says to the drama team or worship band. It's not there. It doesn't mean that those things are necessarily wrong and that we shouldn't have those. But these things are to simply equip and inform. We are to teach and to instruct with God's word so that the work of ministry might be accomplished at an informal level, at an intimate relational level. This work of faith and labor of love that we see in Thessalonica is, is not done at a 30,000 foot high level. It's done at the ground level by getting to know others and talking to others about real life and gospel issues and praying with each other about the hard things. Praying about the good things, the sinful things, and the glorious things in each other's lives. I am in no way equating myself to the Apostle Paul. He was the chief of sinners. Uh, it's a joke. Just seeing if you guys were still awake. It's hot. It's been long. I'm about done. But like Paul, I am so thankful for this body. I am thankful for you all. And I truly believe that this is your heart. I truly believe that you all want what Christ wants. You want to do it Christ's way and for Him. And I know that these things are going on with many of you in here today because I've experienced these things from you. I love Christ more because of your ministry to me. I'm encouraged by you. But if you look at Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord that you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And that's what I want to encourage you with this morning. Do so more and more. The couple of translations use the word excel. Excel still more in these things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for many things that we have read this morning and looked at. We thank you for Manhattan Bible Church, beloved by God, that those in here this morning who are our believers have been loved by you with a love that you determined to set on them before time began. It is a love that none of us have earned. It's a love that none of us can keep. But it's a love that is found in the glorious person and work of Jesus Christ. So Lord, may that be our our sounding board, may that be our target, may that fill in all the spaces in between as we move forward. Lord, we pray for your favor, Wh whatever that might look like. We know that you are good and that you are wise and that you are sovereign and that nothing happens apart from your loving hand so, Lord, help us to be a body who is submissive to her head, but does all things for her glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.